God in the midst of human suffering. And of course, uh, even Pope Francis talks that way of going out to the peripheries and to encounter God. And that all of us are healed in that encountering of God when we're in solidarity with others who are suffering. Um, anyway, those are some of my thoughts. But uh, I appreciate very much. And we still have time for further uh, thoughts, uh, questions, and, and other things you may want to say to us, too. Uh, Bob, you've had your Well, I, 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 I this gentleman wants to talk to you. No, 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 please, please go ahead. Um, I noticed there are still countries uh, that um, use the term blood money. In fact, I just saw a movie where somebody had an injury to somebody, killed his son or something, and the way it was settled was with blood money. They gave them money. And uh, I've been in India, and it's easy to drive me in a car to a village and run over a person who was the main support of his family. They, they would accept blood money. So that that is actually, in, and it, it exists now in societies. I know it exists. I guess that feeling that something has to be paid <laughs> when these you know, bad things. I'm not sure whether the wrongdoing has happened or maybe it was an accident, but, but somehow the problem must be redressed and perhaps at great cost. traditional legal system, the Brayon Law, the, the reparation payment, and it was listed, you know, everything had a price, and that was the reparation payment if there was an injustice done. At the end of this, as we are coming to your summation, what is coming into my head is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and the fact that he lived in a world of suffering and did suffer, and yet was able to forgive and was able to be compassionate, is such an unfolding concept into the presence of God, that if anything, it takes us along into that unfolding, into that being aware of the presence of God and how it affects a human life. Jesus, 
and uh, finding ways to redeem everything in, in the midst of the, the unexpected. And, um, so I'm thinking of, uh, it leads me to think of Chardin's work uh, as a paleontologist and theologian, when uh, he talked about, you know, that the, the resurrection of Christ uh, becomes then the uh, the omega point to which everything is proceeding and all of creation and all of the universe is being now transformed into the reality of God. Um, anyway, I just have some of these thoughts as you're speaking about... Uh, about and I, I think if I understood what you just said, you don't hesitate to say I didn't, but if, I, if I'm off track here, but... In classical theism, we have a scheme in which God has a meticulous plan. Every last thing is part of the plan, all completely foreknown. Uh, and now with process theology and, and something about open theism, which is a, a big topic in my area of philosophy of religion, we have a scheme in which the future is not so completely known, and in which God is constantly interacting with, with uh, events in history as they go along, and uh, I have found in discussing with these ideas with many people that some people gravitate to one or the other of those, and for some people, the idea of a God is much more interactive and responding, maybe even sometimes surprised at what happens, but always able to, to uh, work with it and bring good out of uh, evil and so on, is much more appealing to some, uh, to others, that idea of meticulous providence, as it's called, or, even, okay, am I going to move this finger in the next 10 seconds? That's all part of the plan. Yeah. For some people, that idea is much more of a plan. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I guess the whole area of the of the predestination versus free will, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I'm, I'm, as a uh, uh, mathematician and physicist, I, uh, I have a problem with process theology in that uh, it smacks of deism, which is deeply rooted in classical Newtonian physics in the way it sees the universe. And uh, God started the universe at time t equals zero, and ever since then it's been clanking along according to <laughs> some de deterministic laws. It's the ultimate expression of predestination of the ultimate perversion of it. If you may turn it into a metaphysical statement rather than simply, uh, this is a good way to describe what we see and what we experience. Uh, of course, quantum physics and general and relativity, especially general relativity, and the as yet unsuccessful attempts to reconcile uh, uh, gen general relativity or some form of group theory of gravity with quantum theory leads us to believe that things are, are uh, first of all, that there's a lot that we will never know. Uh, we, quantum physics tells us that what we see is, and what we observe is only part of what's going on. And uh, that, that's why at times it is unpredictable, even at the most basic physical level, so we can't tell when that particular radioactive atom is going to decay. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't know. Uh, I, I guess I'm still stuck with divine foreknowledge. I can't have a problem with it. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Not so bad. Steve, uh, uh, is there any one last thing you uh, want to say? And then I think we should, because of time. I, I think I've really been able to say what I hope to, to get out and I thank you all very much for coming. Yeah. Thank you. And Steve, thank you so much for all the thoughtfulness you've put into this, all of your own reflection and study and uh, you know all of your uh, theological reflection comes out of who you are as a Christian, someone living the, the Christian life and reflecting on it. What is this about? And, uh, and helping us uh, think it through. I appreciate you coming these two weeks very, very much. And it certainly leaves a lot of questions open, uh, like uh, David's uh, critique. Uh, I appreciate that very much. 
Thank you all, and uh, may you have a blessed Holy Week coming up next week and uh, Easter time. Thank you.